Madam President, members of council, invited guests, my fellow citizens, it is my pleasure to bring back a long-standing tradition in the city of Port Clinton, that being the State of the City Address. Tonight, we're going to talk about where we've been in the past couple of years, where I believe we can go, and a plan to get us to where we need to be. And we're going to use these four generalized topics. In February of 2018, I was thinking about running for mayor, and I met with two groups of, of individuals, the then juniors at Port Clinton High School, and about 200 adult citizens of Port Clinton. Many are seated in here in this room. And I gave each group a single piece of paper with 13 generalized issues on it and asked them to choose their top five and place them in order. Ironically, both groups had the same top six in slightly different order. But those top five are right here. From Attitude of the Citizens at number five, Downtown Revitalization, job creation, city finances, and of course, roads and infrastructure. Those five things have been my administration's main goal over the past couple of years. Now, there's no doubt that Port Clinton today is very different for the good than it was five years ago, three years ago, or even one year ago. And these are just some of the reasons why they're good, why Port Clinton is, is so much better. Yes, even the one that's highlighted in, in white, there certainly are some negatives there, and we'll talk about it, but there's certainly a lot more positives that have come out of that. As we look at our city beach, two days after I took office, there was a heck of a nor'easter. I almost said hell of a nor'easter. There was a heck of a nor'easter that took out our city beach, and we had to close it for a variety of reasons. But thanks to Mother Nature and the Ability Center of Greater Toledo, we've not only been able to expand our city beach, but provide access to all. Mr. Colson and I talk all the time in the summer, how often we see families together on the beach that normally would not be together. One or two people would be up on the grass while the rest of the family is down on the beach. The accessible ramp placed by the lighthouse end of the beach, as well as two Moby mats, one on either end, have made our city beach accessible to all and has finally put a beach town on Lake Erie. You know, we also have a very extensive maintenance program. Uh, crews are out there every Thursday cleaning the beach, and of course then the dead fish roll up on Friday, and we're, we're screwed for the weekend. But we're doing our best, and it's, it's open for everyone, and that's the key point there. The Lighthouse Conservancy, they have done wonders to that area of Waterworks Park. Not only have they saved history, they've shared it through their docent program, provided art with sculptures, improved the area with walkways, benches, uh, trash cans, soon-to-be picnic tables, and very, very soon, a partnership between the Lighthouse Conservancy, the City of Port Clinton, and Friends of the Park, we will see a restroom facility, not quite as big as those two people, but we will see a restroom facility in Waterworks Park. Are there any members of the Lighthouse Conservancy in the attendance tonight? I'd ask that you stand and, and be recognized for the great work that you're doing in our community. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been fun working with you fellas. Mom, what can I say about Mom? I'm here. No, not, not you, Mom. Not you, not you. Thank you, though. <laughs> Who invited her? <laughs> Meals on Madison or music on Madison? Let's take everybody back to April of 2020. I don't remember which April I'm thinking here. April of 2020, we are, all had been locked down for several weeks, and then the governor said, hey, we're gonna open up restaurants, but at 25% capacity. Now again, in my day job, I up with the condo rental company, for the previous several weeks, I had been taking call after call after call, and cancellation after cancellation after cancellation. Frankly, several hundred thousand dollars worth of cancellations. Now, Port Clinton is unique, in that it has an abundance of restaurants. Most communities just have a number of restaurants sufficient to meet the needs of the citizens in their community. Port Clinton, Sandusky, a few others have an abundance of restaurants because of the second home and tourist population that comes into our community. So I'm thinking, all right, we've got all these people that aren't coming to Port Clinton, all of these restaurants, they're not gonna survive at 25% capacity. So several of us literally stood on the sidewalk on Madison Street in front of what was then Slater's and said, what if, what if we just 
put up some barricades or something and took some picnic tables out of our, our park, put them out here, you know, just to give people an opportunity to get out of their home. Perhaps they don't want to go into a restaurant just yet. Maybe they can't get into the restaurant because it's full. Give them the opportunity to get out there. And boy, did that take off. After the first weekend, I started getting calls. Nicole Kokensberger and I from the Chamber of Commerce hit every Walmart in North Central Ohio trying to find umbrellas. And then the cornhole board showed up. And then the lights showed up, and this showed up, and that showed up. And somebody said, what if we put up a stage, a little stage? And boy, did that take off like, a, like gangbusters. And then at the end of that first year, I get a phone call from a gentleman. It turns out he works for a little company called Live Nation. And he wasn't doing anything, but he has a second home here in Port Clinton. There were no concerts, so he had nothing better to do. And he said, Mike, I, I like what's going on here, but your stage is horrible. I have a professional stage. How about I just give it to you, and you guys take it from there? Well, what you see are just some examples of the more than 100 performances that happened last year at MOM, including the, the dancing skills, of, the dancing skills of, of some of the folks that were down there. Now this year, MOM is coming back. The stage and benches will go up the week of May 15th. The first performance will start May 27th. Again, it'll be a collaboration of downtown partners, as well as partners beyond our downtown. The Chamber of Commerce has been receiving phone calls from folks outside that see the value of having MOM in our downtown. And think about what else mom has done. At one point, there were 15 vacant buildings being renovated, being sold, or getting ready to open with more than 20 businesses. And if you haven't heard, the big one, the old city hall sold two weeks ago. So there's, there's a lot of really cool things happening in our downtown, thanks to this mom. But that mom has a little bit to do, because she likes to shop. <laughs> the art garage. Now, I can't talk about the art garage without bringing up this young lady. You can't see her from here from there because it's too dark back here, but this is Wan Yun Ting, English name Angel, Angel Wong. Angel was one of those students that worked for me in the summer of 2018, and she kept asking me to come to Taiwan. I'm like, no, Angel, I, I, can't, I can't come to Taiwan. She asked every day, every day. I finally said, Angel, if your parents say it's okay for me to come to Taiwan, I'll come to Taiwan thinking that there's no way that's going to happen. And her parents said yes. <laughs> so in March of 2019, I found myself on a 15-hour flight going 12 time zones to the east or to the west because it didn't matter, and spent several weeks in, in Taiwan. In southern Taiwan, there's a city called Kaohsiung. Uh, it's a city no one's ever heard of unless you're in the military in the Vietnam era. It's a town of about 7 million, or excuse me, 3.7 million people. Anything you've ever purchased made in Taiwan was shipped out of the port at Kaohsiung. Well, as that port expanded through the 70s and 80s, everything moved to the other side of the port, which left an area underdeveloped. It became a little seedy, not necessarily a place you want to go to. Well, the forefathers at that time developed the Pier 2 Art Center. And it's now not only a point of pride for that district in Kaohsiung, but the city of Kaohsiung, as well as the entire country of Taiwan. Everywhere I went in Taiwan, once they found out I was in Kaohsiung, have you been to the Pier 2 Art Center? Have you been to the Pier 2 Art Center? So fast forward, I'm flying home, get off the plane, turn on my phone, and I <laughs> come to find out the previous mayor resigned. Uh, two and a half weeks later, some of these folks appointed me mayor. Well, in that interim, I was talking to the then safety service director about what I saw in, in Kaohsiung and their Pier 2 Art Center, and we had this old building that was virtually on the, the chopping block. It was probably going to be a parking lot, had nothing else happened to it. Fast forward, placed on, as mayor of the city of Port Clinton, the very first meeting I had the next morning, April 10th, 2019, was with the members of the Greater Port Clinton Area Arts Council. We talked about a bunch of different things, and we talked about Pier 2 Arts Center. And I said, would you guys have any interest in trying to create something like that here? And they kind of looked at each other and, and said, you know, we've, we've been trying to find a space. They've signed a 30-year lease. They've actually paid the lease in full. They're in the process right now of trying to, to improve that building with a $1.3 million renovation. We're going after some state capital dollars that we hopefully, hopefully will get um, middle of this year to help along with those renovations. Now, I say this all the time, but art brings light. Light brings activity, activity brings people, people bring ideas, and ideas bring commerce. If you don't believe that, 
take a look at what happened, what's happened at MOM. So I'm very much excited about what's happening at the Art Garage. Is there any member of the Greater Port Clinton Area Arts Council in attendance today? Yeah. Is that a hand back there? I can't tell. Nope, okay. Well, thank the art people when you see them. Are all of you familiar with the, the song by uh, Sherry and Lampchop, This Is the Song That Doesn't End, as it goes on and on, my friend? Some people started singing it so very long ago. Well, this is the project that doesn't end. I was first elected to city council in 2008, and this project had been underway for a couple of years since then. But folks, I, I promise you, we were closer to the end than we are the beginning. The fence that you see around the, the, the wetlands is there for a purpose. It's in the final stages of planting native species to try to keep the Phragmite from taking root. The fencing and the, the wires across the top are to, to keep the wildlife um, out of that area and eating those plants. They're coming back in a few weeks, and when I say them, um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, to evaluate the initial set of plantings, plantings, and then we'll continue with additional plantings. That fence is probably going to be there for two, maybe three more years um, before everything is set, and then we, we take over from there. PC Day at Fifth Third Field. What, a, what a, an amazing, amazing day. It was our opportunity to celebrate who we are in another community, and our opportunity, finally, to be a tourist in another community. Based on ticket sales, the Toledo Mud Hens estimate that somewhere between 750 and 1,000 residents of the city of Port Clinton made that trip, either by highway or the Jet Express, over to Fifth Third Field. And we truly did celebrate who we are. We had the Port Clinton Marching Band play the national anthem. Um, Maddox Johnson was our, our play ball kid. We had Bright Beginnings sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Nicole Kokensparger was supposed to throw out the first pitch, but we didn't get there quite in time. <laughs> you know, those, those things happen. <laughs> um, let's see, we had the VFW there to present the colors. And, of course, our hometown hero, our very own Thomas Krupp. Thomas was a, a, a Navy veteran and to this day is still an active member of the Port Clinton Fire Department. He is, in fact, the longest serving <laughs> member of any fire department in Ottawa County. And I know Tom is here today with his wife, Barb, if you wouldn't mind standing and being recognized for your, your years of service to our community. Thank you very much. And I know I'm going to pay for that one later. <laughs> you know, different is good. We had some new people come through uh, different departments in City Hall, but of course that also meant we had to say goodbye to some people. Cole Hatfield found a, a different career path. Excuse me. Of course, Edna Hansen and George Wilbur uh, retired. And unfortunately, we did lose Lisa Monarch uh, due to a, a, an illness the, recently. But we have some new faces and new places. Michelle Bryant, if you wouldn't mind standing, she's our new tax commissioner. That's who you pay your taxes to. <laughs> Joe Brenner has recently been elected as treasurer. He's up front, he won't stand up. <laughs> Gabe Bilo was on city council but traded for a player to be named later. He is now our city auditor. And of course our, our new law director, uh, Dina Shanker, straight from Odessa, Ukraine. He's right over there. There are some new faces on city council as well. Richard Morgan, the name many of us know. Some of you may even know Richard. Graduated from Port Clinton High School, uh, went off to college, made his fame and fortune teaching uh, physics and chemistry to high school students. Richard, if you wouldn't mind standing up. And our newest member of, of city council, Kelly Gangle, Kelly Gangle, this is your second meeting? Yes. Yes, <laughs> second meeting. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly received both her bachelor's and master's degree from the University of West Virginia. No, that's not the Buckeyes, that's another school, but she's, she's good. Enthusiastic to be all, all get out. She's asking lots of questions, very, very engaged in the community, and I look forward to actually working with, with both of them. So thank you both for stepping up and, and taking on the challenge. <laughs> yeah, please stand. Port Clinton Fire and Rescue Department started in 1870 as the Bainbridge Hook and Ladder Company. Believe it or not, they, would, they didn't have a fire levy back then. They sold you a placard. And if, oh, speaking of the fire department, they sold you a placard 
and you hung that placard by your front door. If your house caught on fire and you had the placard, they put the fire out. If your house caught on fire and it didn't have the placard, they'd make sure the two houses on either side that had the placard didn't catch on fire. <laughs> the port, that, that's, that, there's still a placard hanging at the fire station. In 1922, the Portland Fire Department received its first powered engine, which is that black and white picture. It is still in service and still at the Portland Fire Station at 100 years old. It's used for parades and, and funerals. Feel free to stop by. But today, the Portland Fire Department, still primarily volunteer, is the most professional, most well-equipped, and most well-trained department of any in the county, bar none. The fire department serves two jurisdictions, the city of Port Clinton as well as Portage Township, while EMS is a 24-hour manned service at the station, serving the city of Port Clinton, Portage Township, Catawba Township, and Bay Township. Look at the number of runs for a little small fire department here in Port Clinton. They also have transport service in and out of Magruder Hospital. What the Port Clinton Fire Department is today compared to what it was 20 years ago is night and day. I mentioned professional service. Well, that starts from the top. Fire Chief Kent Johnson, who's hiding in the back of the room. If you wouldn't mind, please, standing. Oh, he's not in the back of the room. You know, you see that levy, 15%. Anybody in politics will tell you that when there's a levy on the ballot, 20% of the people will vote yes, just because, and 20% of the people will vote no, just because. And it's those 40 or 60% in the middle that you have to work with. 85% of the citizens of the city of Port Clinton said they support their volunteer fire department, which is amazing. And that goes right back to Chief Johnson. So thank you again, Chief. The Port Clinton Police Department. We said goodbye to longtime patrolman, sergeant, and chief Rob Hickman, wife sitting over there, and said hello to Dave Scott, the new chief. Dave, you mind standing up? The number one thing I'm, I'm asked is, where did you find this guy? Well, the reality is he's been with the Port Clinton Police Department for almost two decades now, but you never see him, or at least most of you in this room never see him, because he worked the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And unless you were out and about doing dastardly things at those hours, <laughs> you, you, didn't come, you didn't come across Dave Scott. They have had their issues of, of their own. Like everyone else, they had some struggles with, with COVID and had some staffing issues. Their equipment, and I think you're, if you stick around for the rest of the city council meeting, their equipment is aging um, and needs, needs some attention. But despite all of that, look at the number of calls our little Port Clinton Police Department handled. Thousands of calls. And if you'd like, can't fall asleep and want some good reading, here's the police report. The good thing and the bad thing is we have a very, very professional police department. The bad thing is they deal with the same things you see on the, 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 the big city news, just not in the great numbers. What you see in the news is, is still in this book, and, and they do a, one heck of a job uh, for a small town department dealing with those issues. One of the previous police chiefs said what happened in Cleveland 40 years ago, what happened in Lorraine 30 years ago, what happened in Sandusky 20 years ago is happening here now. And, and despite all that, they still find time for social and, and civic interaction, obviously ringing the bell for Salvation Army and providing the, the ice rink down at Waterworks Park. I know quite a few of you took advantage of that when it was frozen. So thank you very much to our Port Clinton Police Department. <coughs> now the wastewater treatment plant, our service department, our street department, and our water department, yes, they're individual departments, but they work so closely together that there was just no way to talk about one without talking about the other. And they too were impacted by COVID the past couple of years with staffing issues and social distancing. It's very hard to be social distanced when you're in a pit with a water line break, but it's, it's one of the things that they had to overcome. Of course, they, they too are dealing with a, a very, very, very aging uh, infrastructure. As a matter of fact, some of these folks aren't here right now because they're out dealing with our sixth water line break in the past six weeks. They're in the 100 block of Elm right, right at the moment. So in the upper left-hand corner is Eric Peterson. I know he's out, out and about. Luke Johnson. Julie Frateroli. Julie's here. She's in the water office, but she's here in the room. Thank you, Julie. And our token Michigan fan, Davey Basak, uh, who runs our sewer treatment plant. Um, these folks do a, do a wonderful job with, with, as I said before, aging infrastructure and, and aging abilities. Not, not their abilities, the abilities of the tools that they, that they have at hand. You know, we have, I'm going off topic here, sorry, Trace. We have five dump trucks and snow plows in our, in our fleet. 
Two of them are 22 years of, of age, and one of them just turned 26. So that's another issue that we're going to have to be addressing and should have been addressed yeah. in the past. Coming soon, I promise, our forward-looking infrastructure <laughs> project. I won't fit in with all the details of the past three years, but thanks to the action of City Council and the action of the voters of the City of Port Clinton, this is a reality. It's a $34 million reality, but keep in mind, there's $150 million of needs in the City of Port Clinton. So we're just scratching the surface, but we're taking that step forward. Now everyone's asking, when's it going to start? When's it going to start? Remember, we started with zero. That utility bill that you pay had nothing prior to this dealing with building, rebuilding our infrastructure. So we had to wait. This September, work will begin on plan B, the below ground, the below ground stuff that you see here. And then about this time next year, the road work will begin. I promise it's coming. I, I can't wait for the first call I get, someone complaining that they can't get down their road. I, it's, it, I'm going to love it. It's going to be great. <laughs> And then, of course, there's COVID. You know, obviously, it was a horrific event, not only for us, but the entire world. There's probably some people that would like to be here, but aren't uh, tonight. But at the same time, there were a lot of good things that came out of COVID. Mom wouldn't have happened without COVID. The rediscovery of our downtown wouldn't have happened without COVID. As individuals and groups, the way we look at our lives on a daily basis and how we reorganize ourselves to make it better, safer, wouldn't have happened. And I think when this all comes out, yes, huge negative sides, but the positives are certainly going to outweigh those negatives. And then, of course, we have a whole bunch of other folks. And if you forgive me, I've got to walk over here because as many of you know, I can't see that far. Our planning commission, uh, headed by Jeff Morgan, the planning commission has taken up the, the task of looking at our zoning ordinances and has gone to great lengths to update a good chunk of our zoning ordinances. Uh, the next step on the, on the hit parade are solar panels and vacation rentals and updating. Architectural Review Board, which is a subset of the Planning Commission specific to our downtown area. Uh, that's headed by our zoning, uh, excuse me, yeah, our zoning commissioner, uh, Todd Bickley. They have recently adopted the rules and regulations to make them a viable entity in our downtown community and have set the groundwork by reorganizing how they function to, to really move forward in our community. The Tree Commission. The Tree Commission had a meeting earlier today. Larry Holman's in the back of the room there. Larry Holman's been our Tree Commissioner for quite some time. I'm proud to announce that uh, 2022, 2022 will be the 13th, excuse me, 33rd year in a row that Port Clinton has been designated a Tree City USA. And a lot of that goes to the, the dedication of, of Larry as our tree commissioner. You may see Larry in our downtown. He, he works, there's more sweat, volunteer sweat equity coming out of Larry Holman than anybody else in, in this city. He is constantly pulling weeds, watering something, planting something, calling Tracy, uh, saying we need to do this. So again, Larry, thank you very much for your service to the community. And he really does deserve a round of applause for what he does. Our Civil Service Commission uh, was comprised of three individuals headed by Carl Koble, uh, who couldn't be here tonight due to illness. Their primary goal is to ensure that the individuals that serve the community are qualified to do so. Uh, if you're available, tomorrow, tomorrow at 10 o'clock in city council chambers, we'll be swearing in the newest sergeant on our police force. Ryan Yost uh, took the sergeant's test just recently, uh, passed, and he will be the, the newest sergeant uh, in our police force. So congratulations to Ryan and thanks to the Civil Service Commission for what they do. Chamber of Commerce in Main Street, Port Clinton. Uh, I, I can't say enough good things about these groups. You know, they, they both work out of the same office, both share the staff. Nicole Kokensparger is a go, 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 go person. Um, they are charged with promoting the downtown area and the exchange of commerce in our, in our community. They oversee the operations of MOM as well as the Walleye Festival, soon to be the Walleye Drop, and several other activities in our downtown. They're the first stop when these new places come into town to, to get started. So again, congratulations to, to Nicole. The Friends of the Parks and the Cemeteries. Are there members of Friends of Parks and Friends of Cemetery here? Please stand. You guys do a, a wonderful job as well, filling the gaps where the city gets. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> 
So you're supposed to stand so I can take a drink of water. <laughs> the Friends programs fill the gaps that, quite frankly, the city doesn't have the resources to do. All the pavement that's taking place in our cemeteries, a lot of the new activities you've seen in the parks, and as I mentioned, the restroom facility that's coming very soon, are all thanks to the volunteer efforts of, of our friends. And I, I say that term friends and, and really do mean it. You do a wonderful job for the community. Portland City Schools. Is Pat here tonight? That's a, what's the one thing when you move into a new community you look at? What are the schools like? And we have award-winning schools that are top shelf when it comes to the use of technology and, and services. They're, they're producing wonderful kids going on to do wonderful things uh, some coming back to Port Clinton. So I can't say enough positives about the, the Port Clinton School District. Magruder Hospital, I know Nick is here, CEO of, of Magruder Hospital. Would you please stand up, Nick? Oh, over there. Over there. We're, we're a town of 6,000 people. Why do we have a hospital that offers so many services? Nick, is there any other community that you know of that has 6,000 people that has a hospital like Magruder Hospital? Not at all. Yeah, it, it's, it's, we're very, very, very fortunate to have that, that service here in our community. And if you would, sir, yeah, thank you. If, if you would, please pass along my sincere thanks, and I believe everyone's sincere thanks to everyone on your staff for what they've gone through the past couple of years with COVID. We really appreciate what you've done. Thank, thank you. you. Ida Rupp Public Library. Go ahead and stand up. I saw you back there. <laughs> Lin Lindsay, Lindsay Faust is the director of the Idaho Public Library. And a fellow Kiwani. You know, libraries have changed a great, a great deal. I don't have my phone with me, but, you know, you can find a phone anywhere at any time with your, with your cell phone. Or find a, a book anywhere. So they've had to adapt and, and change as technology and, and the community has evolved. And I think Lindsay has done a, an absolute spectacular job. Of, of filling that need and providing a vital service to our community. So thank you very much, Lindsay. And then, of course, our service organizations, Kiwanis, Lions, Rotary, VFW, uh, Masons, Greater Port Clinton Area Arts Council, Eagles, Elks. I, I know I'm forgetting some. Would you please stand and be recognized if you're a member of a service organization? Don't sit down just yet. If, if you would, if starting in the front, tell, tell us your name and what service organization you belong to. Steve Banachek, uh, head trustee at the Port Clinton Helps. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Lindsay Faust, Kiwanis. Uh, Kevin Francis, president of Rotary. Connie Rowe, Kiwanis. Kiwanis, yeah. And I saw over here. Dina Shanker, Kiwanis. And I'm also a Kiwanian. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, there are more? Forgive me. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Pam Hatfield, Elks. Elks. Thank you very much. Folks, you provide such a great service. You, you feed the hungry, you build parks, you, you sponsor sports teams, you aid those with disabilities. It goes on and on and on and on. And best of all, you all do it and you have fun doing it. And that's the best part. So again, thank you all very much for the service that you provide to our community. Now, as we look for the future, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first state of the city address that's happened in, in quite some time, whether it was COVID related or other. It, it's, been, it's been a while. In 2020, my dad and I uh, took the trip of a lifetime to Asia. We left on the, the 6th of March. On the 12th of March, my mother called and said, get your keys to your home, boys. There's something going on here. So we took an emergency flight home on the 13th of March uh, back, back from Asia. My intent at that point was to have a State of the City address and talk about some of the future plans that, that you'll see here in just a moment. Well, obviously, the best laid plans went, went awry. Mr. Colston and I, at the start of the fourth quarter of last year, revisited those ideas. We obviously got rid of some of those because they didn't necessarily fit with a post-COVID world. We also threw in a few more that, that were very appropriate for a post-COVID world. We then organized them into different categories had a conversation with our president of council, Lisa Sardi, to see if they met with the goals of council and then sat down with every single council member. Getting council involved in this is key for success. If you come to a regular city council meeting, often you'll find that the votes are seven nothing in favor of something. 
That's because the screaming and shouting happened in committee meetings leading up to that, that city council meeting. And all of the details and all of the, the positioning happened in those other meetings. Come to one of those sometimes if you want to see the excitement. So it's key to get the city council involved. And how do they get involved? Through their committees. There are four committees. And I went, little, I went ahead. Sorry. The four committees that you see here have all been tasked with what we're about to talk about. They've heard this before, so they can go get cookies if they want. But we're going to share this with, with you today. Our finance committee, vehicle rotation program. We talked about the age of some of our snow plows and dump trucks and the, the need for the police cruisers. Looking at the fire department, yes, there's a fire levy. But if you are transported out of Magruder Hospital to another location with the Port Clinton Ambulance Service, you're going to get a bill. And because that ambulance service is such a good service, and the billing is such a good billing process, the revenue generated is now able not only to support the EMS side of the fire and rescue, but also now able to help the fire department. So when it comes time for that fire levy renewal in a couple of years, chances are we're not going to have to ask for an increase. And I hope I don't find myself being a liar in a couple of years. But that's that. I, I told you that. Tell you that story to then talk to you about my idea for vehicle rotation program. Right now a parking ticket is $20, and very few parking tickets are written in the city of Portland. And to the police officer's credit, when they see a violation, and I've seen it before, I've been in an a la carte cafe at lunchtime, officer walks in and says, hey, who's got that red Jeep out there? Do you mind moving it? It's, it's parked illegal. Well, what they should do is just write that ticket. I would also suggest that parking tickets go from $20 to $49. There are laws on the books that dictate parking rules and regulations that council at some point in, in the lifespan of council has said these are things we want. It's time for the administration side to enforce the rules that they set into place and dedicate those funds back to supporting our vehicle rotation program. And if you think, well, is that, is that ethical? Well, folks, there are entire departments and other police agencies dedicated to parking enforcement with the goal of enforcing those parking regulations as well as generating revenue to support other efforts in the city. Police cruiser is 35, let's say it's $35,000 and our tickets are $49. 365 days in a year, if you do the math real quick, a police force would have to write two parking tickets a day for a year in order to pay for a police cruiser. I saw more than that just driving up here from, from my office downtown, both in residential and in downtown areas. These are rules that city council has adopted over the years. It's time that we enforce them as other communities are doing. Second home and investor properties. Now this is gonna be strange coming from someone who deals with second home and investor properties, but until recently, those second home and investor properties have been for the most part on Perry Street North. The, the condos, the second homes. Well, they're now starting for a variety of reasons. The uh, abundance and knowledge of Airbnb, VRBO, Rent Jill's House, Booking.com, and all those other things that most of you probably didn't know existed, but have been around for quite some time, the ability to rent private properties instead of a hotel room for your vacation. COVID has also played a role. Um, we found in, in my daily business that more people are looking for vacation rentals because it's secluded, as opposed to going into a hotel room. But what happens when that second home is on Taft Street, for instance? And there are second home vacation rentals on Taft Street. Well, that home, for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, had had a family living in it. And that family went to church, and went to the grocery store, and sometimes came to a city council meeting, and had kids in, in softball, and had coaches, and, and did everything that, that residents of a community do, including paying income tax. Well, now that home is in a vacation rental pool, and yes, some of that stuff might still happen with the vacationer, but because it's not their primary residence, it's no longer paying income tax. And yes, we have a city bed tax of 3%, meaning if your hotel room is $100 or your vacation rental is $100 per night, 3% is added on to that that comes to the city's general fund. We need to have a better system in place to, to identify and track those, collect that bed tax, 
and maybe look at other sources that are allowable under state law to collect a little bit more of that, that revenue that should be coming from those, those properties. Otherwise, it's going to fall on everyone else. So those are the things charged to the Finance Committee. Economic development. For years, the city of Portland has been talking about the need for a grant writer. You know, when we have the big projects like the, the FLIP, the Forward Looking Infrastructure Project, the engineering firms that come in to do the work provide those, those grant writers. What I'm talking about is the grant writer to help the tree commission buy some more trees, or the parks and rec folks to get playground equipment, or benches, or whatnot. A few years ago, the Chamber of Commerce acquired a computer program where you type in a category and it will go out and search the World Wide Web for a grant that could potentially serve that benefit. Unfortunately, the Chamber of Commerce nor the city has anyone on staff or with the ability or time to, to actually physically write that grant. I've been approached by a few people that would like to, to provide that service. But we need to figure out a balance. Is this something the city does alone? Is it something that the city and the Chamber and Main Street partner together? And then how do we, how do we pay that person? Is it a flat fee and they just write as many grants as they can? Or is it a percentage of whatever dollars are generated back to the city. And so that's step one for the economic development group. Business registration. When, and it's, this has happened quite a bit, obviously, now that more and more businesses are coming into the city of Port Clinton. Mr. Colson and I will sit down with the, the business folks and they'll say, what's your business registration fee? And we look at each other and say, we don't have one. And come to find out, we're about the only community in the state of Ohio that doesn't have a business registration fee and a business registration license. What that does, it becomes the point of contact so our tax commissioner knows who to send income tax forms to. It becomes a point of contact so our water department knows how much to charge on an equivalent dwelling unit. It becomes a point of contact so our zoning inspector makes sure that the business that's going into that particular property meets the zoning requirements and is amenable to the citizens of Port Clinton. The list of things go on and on and on. Um, I've made inroads to a couple of communities surrounding us that have this information. We're gathering that, and that's typically how an ordinance is, is written. Very frequently, very infrequently, <coughs> does a new ordinance come out of, of the law director's office. Not that she's not doing her job, it's just the way it works. You get one from Fremont, scratch off Fremont, right in Port Clinton, make a few other adjustments, and there you go. It's reviewed and, and, and adopted. So that's a business registration license. It's another thing that, that I've asked this committee to take a look at. Another one of the things that's, that's just popped up recently are construction dumpsters. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful, don't get me wrong, that there are construction dumpsters in our downtown and in our alleys and in some of our boulevards. But at the same time, it's a little bit of an inconvenience, especially when it's in an alley that prohibits two cars from going down, or it's taking up a few parking spots in front of a business that also the parking spots serve other businesses. So what if we implemented a nominal fee, 15, 20 bucks a day. Do you think that would motivate the folks that are doing the renovations on that building to go a little bit faster to get that dumpster out of there so they're not paying a fee back to the city? And who knows, maybe that fee goes to the fireworks. Just, just saying, just saying. Who knows? And then increased public art. You know, I, I mentioned before, art leads to commerce. Maybe the city isn't directly involved in buying the art, but there's something called a licensed partnering authority, LPA. We do it all the time uh, for various entities. We're working on one right now for the Jet Express. The Jet Express has purchased a large hoist. The funds are coming from the federal government. The federal government can't pay the Jet Express directly. They pay the city of Port Clinton. Eric Peterson, who is our special projects coordinator, coordinates with the Jet Express, so when this particular phase of the, the project is done, he releases the funds, no harm, no foul. Doesn't cost the city anything, but perhaps we can work with the Greater Port Clinton Area Arts Council to get more public art in our public spaces. Emergency services. How many of you watched the Super Bowl a couple weeks ago? Did, did everybody watch the commercials? How many gas-powered car commercials were there? Zero. And since then, I don't know if I have seen a gas-powered commercial, gas-powered car commercial. Electric vehicles are the future. Um, Ford has announced that by 2030, I believe it is, 100% of their vehicles will be uh, electric. Toyota, Honda, and, and the GM have also announced that, that the majority of their vehicles will be electric powered. Now, yes, 
the market forces will start to transition gas stations into charging stations, but let's get ahead of the curve. There are some very innovative programs out there that will give the city free chargers. And let's say we put one at the city beach or the parking lot next to the, uh, the post office or in other key spots around town. And when someone's looking at coming to Port Clinton, Ohio or Duck, North Carolina with an electric vehicle, they, they may think twice and think about coming to Port Clinton, Ohio because of that charging station. They're not going to be free, meaning the individual with the vehicle will have to swipe their credit card or go onto the app and the city can, can generate revenue. The charging stations are free to the city of Port Clinton. We would just have to, the cost of, of mounting them and working with the electric company, getting the power from its source to the, to the charging station. But it's very, very doable and something that can be done quite simply and quite quickly. Mentioned earlier how our planning commission is looking at city zoning regulations and uh, updating those. I've asked the Emergency Services Committee to do the same with all of the other, or other ordinances out there. You know, there was a great deal of conversation uh, internally, and it, it got out, about the snow, snow removal process for your sidewalks. That ordinance was written in 1951. You think it's a little bit outdated? Probably. There are also ordinances that conflict with each other. Whether this task is undertaken by the Emergency Services Commission, the Emergency Services Committee, or a third party entity, let's have that discussion and get this ball rolling because on a daily basis, some of these issues are, are popping up and, and need to be addressed. Excuse me. Attacking blight. Folks, there are estimate between 30 and 50 habitual blighted properties in the city. It doesn't sound like a lot when we're in a community of 3,200 parcels of land, but it's a big deal if you're right next to it or if you have to drive by it every day. I'm talking things like broken windows, uh, lawn furniture on the, on the furniture in the front lawn, trash receptacles that don't move, junk cars. The process in place now is very, very dated. If you're pulled over by the police department, they don't give you a 14-day warning to correct your speeding habits, but by state law, you're given a 14-day notice to remove that, that chair from your, your front porch. Mr. Shanker has looked at what, some other, what other communities have done, and we're very, very close to announcing um, activities through the, the committee on how we can better address, in a timely fashion, the issue of blight in our community. Moving on to our next committee. Shortly after the discussion of development of Waterworks Park was settled a few years ago, a group of people, including myself, some business owners in downtown, um, an engineer, architect, got together and developed a comprehensive citywide, not just focusing on Waterworks Park, but citywide parks and recreation program. If we want world class parks, we need to have a plan to do them. One of the good things about Port Clinton is a lot of people have a lot of great ideas. One of the bad things about Port Clinton is a lot of people have a lot of great ideas. As an example, the, part, the, the playground, the accessible playground, absolutely wonderful. As a Kiwanian, I played a role in, in getting that going. Kiwanis Lions and Rotary came together and put in that $750,000 play place. But there was never any discussion about how that play place in that location would impact the rest of City Park. And that discussion needs to happen because nothing else can happen down there. The, the services that are offered in that park have reached their capacity. And it goes on and on. It would be great to have a, a pickleball court. But how does the implementation of a pickleball court somewhere impact the rest of the park. It may preclude something even better down the road. So let's start that conversation and, and have a comprehensive plan. Might not all be installed at once, but at least we have a, a framework so when those ideas come up, we just don't, don't act on them. Let, let's have a plan so it can, it can be worked out. Green energy. <laughs> I wrote this several months ago before Russia did what they were doing, but it, it's an even bigger issue now. Let's take a look and see if we can put solar panels on all the city buildings. The number one electric user for the city of Portland is our, for the city, not in general, is our sewage treatment plant. 
if we can put some solar panels up or some other entity uh, for renewable energy, perhaps we can bring that, that bill down a bit. Think about the roof space on this building. City Hall is closed from 5 o'clock at night on Friday until 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday. What if that renewable energy was bringing revenue back into the city? Let's start that discussion and explore opportunities that are available in our, in our green, green energy. An alley as a viable city planning tool has not been around since the late 30s, early 40s. And if you look at the city of Port Clinton as it has expanded, there are no alleys in neighborhoods built since World War II. They served a purpose. They provided an avenue of service, milk delivery, newspaper delivery, and, and diaper delivery, and an access point for the immediate residents around there. Did you know that it's illegal to drive through an alley unless you are a property owner? I do it all the time. I, you know, it's one of the things. What if the city abandoned all the alleys in town and gave them back to the property owners? So if, if you have, you live here and your neighbor's there and this is the alley, that alley split right down the middle, you guys share it. If this guy's garage is at the back of his property, there's something called an appurtenant easement that dictates this alley has to stay open to that garage. You can't impact the economic viability of that property. Likewise, if there are uh, utilities underground, you can't put a shed over top of it. But there's nothing that says once you get to that garage, you couldn't block it off so people don't go through and you have green space or whatever you want to do with that, with that space. Again, alleys are, are there for the exclusive use of those that abut those alleys. Why not give them back to those people? And as an added incentive, any time that property is placed back into the possession of the, the alley is placed back into the possession of the property, it gets put on their tax bills. Well, let's just say we give a 10-year abatement. So for 10 years, that additional property, and it's only going to be a few bucks, but that additional property is not put on the tax bills to give those property owners time to figure out what they want to do with that, with that new space. Trust me, it'll solve a lot of problems. They're speeding through my alley. Well, they're not going to be able to speed if it's blocked off. So it, it's, it's something worth exploring. We've talked about a lot of things for, for the future of Port Clinton. And as we, as we work our way through this, we have, need to realize that Port Clinton is a unique, strong, and proud community. This has been demonstrated again and again, example <coughs> after example, with the people that have stood and raised their hand in this room. We have generational challenges that we're trying to fix, and there's no simple solution to any of these. It's going to take a long time but it's time to start to address these issues that have been in our community for years. We need to expect better. We need to change the attitude of our citizens. Expect better from the city. Expect better from your neighbors. And expect better from yourself. When we do that, we all continue this spiral upwards. <coughs> Madam President, Members of council, invited guests, my fellow citizens, it's my distinct honor to state to all of you that because of all of you, the state of our city is great. Thank you.